Patrick, I'll, let, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and the topic. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Brannan, and I work at the Highlands Biological Station. Um, the Highlands Biological Station is in the extreme western part of uh, North Carolina. Most people think that North Carolina stopped at Asheville, but it doesn't. Uh, we're two hours west of Asheville, so we're way out in the middle of nowhere in Macon County, North Carolina, which is right in the corner of uh, South Carolina and Georgia, North Carolina. We're actually part of Western Carolina University. We're just not on the main campus. We're another hour west of Cullowhee, North Carolina, where Western is located. Um, but what the Highlands Biological Station is, is we're a field research station where scientists come from all over the United States, and in some cases the world, to study the plants and animals of the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, the thing we're probably most famous for is salamander research. Lots of classic studies on salamanders have taken place at the Highlands Biological Station or in the surrounding national forest. You can see we've even incorporated it into our logo here because so many researchers come here to study salamanders because the Southern Appalachian are the salamander capital of the world. But it is also the shrew capital of North America. Um, and so my studies have been on salamanders but also on small mammals such as shrews. Um, these shrew oh, I'm going to get into more detail later, but the, tonight's topic is on the effects of littering on these small mammals. A lot of these small mammals root around in the leaves and they go into bottles that people have discarded on the sides of roads and they become entrapped in there and they can't get out. So students and I have been going around and collecting bottles off the sides of roads and examining them for skeletal remains of these small mammals. Um, so, like I said, this is the salamander capital of the world, but in, at least for North America, it's also the shrew capital. Um, we, right here in the southern Appalachians, we have eight species of shrews, which is a lot for a, for a small mammal like a shrew. But what is a shrew? A lot of people kind of think, well, it, it looks kind of like a mouse. Maybe it's some kind of rodent or something. Well, it's not. It's a small mammal, but it is not a rodent. Let's begin by talking about what rodents are. Um, rodents are things like mice and voles, not moles, voles with a V, which are kind of like little short-tailed mice with furry ears. Um, squirrels, rats, chipmunks, all of those are rodents. Well, what makes them a rodent? Rodents have teeth like this. Okay, all of them have those big elongated front incisor teeth, those buck teeth, um, for gnawing on seeds, or a, in the case of a beaver, a tree, Anyway, gnawing animals. Um, so they have these elongated incisors that never stop growing, by the way, because they're always wearing them down. So they keep continu continuously grow to compensate for tooth wear. And then they have this gap here because on other mammals, that's where they have like canine teeth to eat meat. Uh, but rodents are herbivores mostly. Um, so they have no teeth there and then they have flat molars in the back. So whether you're talking about a little bitty mouse or a giant rat or a groundhog or something like that, they all have skulls like this um, for their herbivorous lifestyles and for gnawing on seeds and whatnot. Um, I put this in there because when you're looking for remains of skeletal, uh, skeletal remains in bottles, um, it's difficult to identify it to species, but you can narrow it down if it's a rodent to either a mouse or a vole but based on their molars. So on a mouse, they typically have these round peg-like molars, kind of like our teeth. But on a vole, which are those little furry, short-tailed mice things, um, they have molars that are like big lightning bolts. So that's a useful little thing to kind of narrow down what you find in these bottles or in owl pellets. But shrews and moles are insectivores. Okay, they're, they're small mammals, but they're not rodents. Um, insectivores don't have those big buck teeth because they're not gnawing on things. They have rows of sharp pointy teeth for shredding up insects. I'm gonna come back to the slide in just a second, but this is what an insectivore's teeth look like by contrast. So little insects like beetles and things have hard exoskeletons, hard shells. So they have all these rows of pointy teeth for shredding those up. Um, bats have teeth like this too, because they're insectivorous. Um, but I'll go back there. So a mole, um, of course, tunnels underground. They have these big, flat, shovel-like feet with long claws for digging and pushing the dirt out of the way. They also have really short, fine fur because they don't want to get stuck in the tunnel under the ground. Um, and they have these long, pointy snouts with those teeth. You'll also note kind of the, not the total absence, but very small eyes and ears 
that they can't use because they're underneath the ground. So they they're not mice. They also, um, like I said, they have very small eyes and ears and short fur. Shrews are like moles, but they don't have these big feet, so they don't tunnel under the ground. Instead, they find insects by rooting around in the leaves on the forest floor surface, and they're very tiny. This is one on a leaf. Okay, so they're they're not rodents. They're just small mammals. And like I said, here's the teeth. The moles have these big, sharp, pointy teeth. Shrews um, have similar teeth, but they also have these long hooked incisors that they use like forceps to pick up tiny insects. Okay, now it depends on where you are in the state, um, but we're located in the mountains. So these are the species you'll find in the mountains. Um, the biggest one is called the Northern Short-Tailed Shrew, which is about the size of a mouse. And of course it has a little short tail, but you can tell it's not a mouse because it has short fur, very small eyes and ears, and that long pointy snout full of sharp teeth. Um, this is super common, in the, at least in the mountains. In the eastern part of the state, you have the southern short-tailed shrew, but it looks very similar. Um, this is a venomous mammal. Now, there aren't very many venomous mammals in the world, but this is one of them. Now, it's not like a rattlesnake or something like that. It has a very mild venom in its saliva. Um, that it uses to paralyze insects. You might be wondering, well, what's the point? Why not just bite them and kill them? Why, why, why just paralyze insects with their poison? Well, insects have really, I mean insects, uh, shrews have really uh, high fast metabolisms. So they're constantly on the search for food, but if they're full, they don't want these prey to get away and go to waste. So instead they bite them and just stun them. But you might be wondering, well, why not just kill them? They're not gonna run away if they're dead. This way, by keeping them alive, they can store them for later and they won't spoil because they're not dead. So anyway, if you get bitten by one, it doesn't really do much. I've been bitten before and it made my finger numb. Like when I went to the dentist, I had a cavity filled. I mean, it stayed like that for a couple of hours and then it faded away. But if you're an insect, that's, that's what it does. It paralyzes you. Anyway, that's a really common shrew that you find all over the place. Um, here in the mountains, we also have long-tailed shrews, which is genus Sorex. Um, so this is a smoky shrew, which is also very common. You can see how small it is compared to this leaf. Um, it gets its name because it has this kind of gray, smoky fur, which you can, again, you can tell it's a, a shrew because it has this long, pointy snout and really short fur and so forth. Um, but that's still a considered a pretty large shrew. They get progressively smaller. So the next one is called a masked shrew. Um, it doesn't really have a mask. I'm not sure why they call it that. Um, but the scientific name is Sorex cinereus, and that means reddish brown, like cinnamon. So it has this kind of reddish brown fur. And that's even smaller. And then we have one that's even smaller yet again called the pygmy shrew. Um, this is its skull compared to a dime, just to show you how tiny it is. This is the, sec uh, the second smallest mammal in the world and the smallest one in North America. The smallest one in the world, I think, is the bumblebee bat. But in North America, this is the smallest mammal. So they root around the leaves and eat teeny tiny insects. But the real question is, what, what is special about the Southern Appalachian Mountains? Why do they have so many more species of shrews than other places? Well, part of it has to do with the topography, especially where we are, where Highlands is located. We're right on the edge of the Blue Ridge Escarpment. So it's a very short trip down into South Carolina. It's only like 30 minute drive, but you drop 3000 feet in elevation in that short distance. So it's just a very abrupt shift, which means you're gonna get overlap of Northern species at high elevations and Southern species at lower elevations, all kind of in this zone. So you get kind of a double dose of species, these Northern ones and Southern ones converging at the same latitude. Um, but within that latitude, they kind of segregate themselves based on elevation. So at the top of the mountain, you'll get things like mass shrews, and then down in the valleys, you'll get southeastern shrews. So they they all coexist in that same latitude, but not in the exact same place. It just depends on elevation. Within that, they segregate themselves further by based on habitat. So some things like the short-tailed shrew is ubiquitous. It's all over the place. You find it in very dry south-facing slopes and north-facing slopes. But some of those other ones you only find in very, very wet habitats only or in riparian zones because they have really high water turnover rates. 
Um, anyway, so here again is kind of the species assemblages. So at high elevations in the mountains, you get mainly these four species, and they're progressively smaller. So you have the short-tailed shrew, which is even bigger. Then you have the smoky shrew, mass shrew, and pygmy shrew. And you can see they have decreasing body size. Occasionally, you get some other rare species. There's one called a rock shrew that um, is about the size of the smoky shrew, but it's found in rock outcrops and boulder fields. And then there's a cool one called the water shrew, which has little fringes on its feet, and it dives into streams and eats aquatic insects. But those are very rare. But then as you go down the mountain, those are replaced by species counterparts. So the pygmy shrew is replaced by another one that's the same body size called the least shrew. The mass shrew is replaced by the southeastern shrew. The smoky shrew doesn't really have a species counterpart or body size equivalent. And then the northern one is replaced by the southern one. These are the ones you have more in the eastern part of the state too. So low elevation or eastern southern species. Um, these body size differences helps them to coexist because by being different sizes, they occupy slightly different microhabitats and therefore eat slightly different prey. So they're not in direct competition for space or food, and it, but it's based on body size. Okay, so the main part of the study that I've been doing most recently, still been a few years since I've really done this, as I said, is looking at the effects of littering on these animals. Um, trash is found all over our highways, sadly, and it kills lots of wildlife each year because, like I was saying, they the shrews in particular um, don't have good eyesight. They root around by sense of smell. So they they root around, they find this bottle, and they think the opening is just a tunnel, or they go in there looking for water, um, and then they get trapped, especially if the bottle is on a slope, as in this drawing here, because it serves as a miniature pitfall trap. They fall down in there, and the, the uh, glass or the plastic is too slippery for them to climb back out. Or if rainwater is collected in the bottom of the bottle, then they drown in there. So lots and lots of animals get trapped in these bottles each year. So the objectives of our study was twofold. One of it was just to, as a survey technique. There's no need to go out and set like traps because they're out there just waiting to be found. So we would look for bottles. And if we found bones in it, um, we would get GPS coordinates. And we could map the geographic distributions of these species, especially as we go up and down the mountain to see where that kind of transition zone is from the northern high elevation species to the southern low elevation species. And there are different habitat associations too. The southern ones tend to be more in drier habitats and the northern ones tend to be in more um, wetter habitats. And then the second part of our study was just to look at the effects of littering. Like what how many animals are dying annually in these bottles? What's the capture rate and some conservation implications of that? So over the years, we had over 200 sites across multiple counties in Western North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina. Um, so what we would did, uh, what we would do is we would just drive around these roads. Um, we did kind of limit our study to um, pullout areas because that's where more bottles tend to accumulate because people pull off the side of the road and they eat their lunch or whatever and they throw the bottles out versus just kind of randomly across the roads. Um, but we would pull off there and we would kind of go about 100 meters up and down the road and into the woods as far as we could find bottles because especially here in the mountains, there's very steep slopes. These bottles don't just stay right on the edge of the roads. They roll way, way, way down the hill and get buried in leaves sometimes 100 meters from the uh, shoulder of the road. So we just continue until we found no more bottles. And we would root, or, uh, shuffle our feet around and look for bottles. Um, we looked at aluminum cans too, but we didn't ever find remains in aluminum cans. Um, other people have, but we never did. So we kind of excluded that from our analyses. But if we found a, a bottle with stuff in it, that or looked like there was something in it, we would bring it back up to the road and we would empty the contents and pick out all the bones and things like that. We would also classify the habitat type based on, on moisture. So some sites were like pine forests farther down the mountain. They were very xeric, hot, dry habitats, all the way to class five, which were these really um, wet, cove hardwood stream habitats with lots of rhododendron and so forth. To see if there was some kind of habitat association with these species. All right, so if you found a bottle, this is what you would find in it. Um, it looks kind of like an owl pellet. Um, it's all fur and bones dry, usually stuck in the bottom or the side of the bottle. Um, but that's if you're lucky. <laughs> usually it's not dry. Usually it's this big 
blob of stinky wet slime that you have to dump out and pick out the bones. But anyway, um, you're lucky this is what it looks like. But here's some examples. Um, so here we have multiple species. This is some sort of mouse here. And then we have short tail shrews here, some smoky shrews here. I will say this is all from a single bottle, which is pretty impressive. The most we've gotten from a single bottle was um, 22 skulls and three different species. That was a larger like wine bottle, but nevertheless, um, multiple things can be tra uh, entrapped in the same bottle. But once you pick out the bones, then comes the task of trying to identify what these things are. Um, and for shrews, it's difficult anytime because you have to look at their skulls and their teeth. And these, like I showed you, the, these things are very, very tiny. Um, but once you've seen them you know, thousands of times, you can identify them just like you can identify different leaves of trees or, or anything else. But what you have to do is look at them under a dissecting microscope and compare uh, mainly these teeth. These are called unicuspid teeth. These are the incisors and then these little pointy teeth or unicuspids. Um, so different species have different sizes and numbers of each of these teeth. So for example, these are two species that are very similar sized. This is the mass shrew and this is the southeastern shrew. Um, on the mass shrew, there's one, two, three, four, five unicuspid teeth that are roughly the same size. But on the southeastern shrew, there's one, two, three, four, five, but the third one and the fifth one are greatly reduced in size. And some other little things to look at is like the snout width and length. So on this one, it's skinnier and longer than this one. This is more kind of triangular and that's more like a lance. And also the brain case is more bulbous on this one, but you have to look at reference collections to kind of judge these things. But that's if they have their teeth. A lot of these things have been soaking in bottles for who knows how long and all the teeth have fallen out. So in those cases, you have to compare them to reference collections. So here's our results. So for the short-tailed shrew, um, it's everywhere in this region. So it ranges in elevations down from 361 over to uh, to 1,300 meters. So way down here in South Carolina, all the way up to the high mountains in, here in Highlands, North Carolina. Um, and they were found in pretty much every moisture habitat type. So in pretty dry pine forests and these and in these very wet um, rhododendron forests. But when you got to the long tail shrews, the, the sorex, um, they tended to be at higher elevations in North Carolina. There were some way down here in Georgia, but this is along a river. So the habitat type, even though it's lower elevation, the habitat type is similar to that up here in North Carolina. So there's little isolated pockets of these in certain areas. But for the most part, these were um, in North Carolina at higher elevations and in very wet habitats. When you got to these smoky, I mean, uh, mask and southeastern shrews, there was a very clear separation, segregation. The mass shrew was only found in North Carolina at high elevations and in very wet habitats. But the southeastern shrew was found in low elevations in very dry habitats. So there's kind of a nice sharp uh, separation. Of those. It's called contiguous allopatry. It means they're, they're separated, but they're right abutted next to each other. And that's based on elevation. So we got some distributional data doing it that way, just by looking at bottles. And, and it kind of beats setting traps, because when you set a trap, you have to go out the next morning. These things are already dead. So it's just a, if it's a nice day, you can just go out there and say, hey, I'm going to go look for bottles. Um, but anyway, here's our results. So we looked at over 10,000 bottles. And bottles included things like milk jugs and, and anything that had a narrow opening. Um, of those, most of them, 59%, were open. They didn't have a cap on it. Um, if they have a cap, then, I mean, yeah, there's trash out there, but it's not going to catch anything. But if they were open, that's a potential trap. At each of those pullout areas, there was an average of 28 open bottles. So there's tons of trash in this area. Um, and after doing the math, it's an average of 382 open bottles per mile. So there's lots and lots of and those are just open ones, not, not the ones with caps on them. So there's lots and lots of garbage and potential traps for these small mammals. And if we extrapolate that to all the, the nights of trapping, there's over 1.7 million trap nights or 382,000 annually. 
A trap night is a chance for an animal to get captured. So if you have one bottle out for 100 nights, that's 100 chances for an animal to get ca uh, captured. Or if you have 100 traps for one night, that's still 100 chances. So that's a, a trap night. Um, anyway, almost 2 million during our study period. The good news is that we went back year after year and we didn't like clean up all the sites. That's impossible. We just only, the only ones we removed were ones that had things in them. All the other bottles we just left there. Um, so we had a count of how many bottles were there from year to year and we could calculate how much more bottles were being added through littering each year. So the good news is that over the several years that we did this, there was only a net gain, gain of 150 bottles across all sites or about one bottle per site each year. So that's good. People aren't continuing to litter, but it's still a gain. And there's still tons of bottles out there. So even though the accumulation rate is slow, it's still increasing. There's still lots of chances for these animals to be killed. Here's a breakdown of our um, captures. So mostly shrews, but we also got other rodents like uh, deer mice and white-footed mice and so forth. We even got one mole out of a bottle. It's the only record of a mole ever taken from a bottle. Anyway, almost 700 animals during our study time, but the real number is this. The capture rate is nearly 12%. So there's lots of bottles and they're capturing these things at a pretty alarming rate. Um, so we got 12 different types of mammals skulls from bottles, five shrews, six rodents, and one mole. We also got some other things. Um, we, occasionally we got some salamanders and a snake. Um, they tend to be able to get out of the bottles easier than, than a mammal can, but nevertheless, they, those get captured too. But also plenty of uh, invertebrate species like beetles and millipedes and snails. Some of the snails in the Southern Appalachians are threatened or endangered species. Um, I didn't study those, but we have the data for those. So we, somebody could follow up and do a study on snails as well. Um, most of the sites, 63%, we found at least one thing. And usually if we found one thing, we found several things. So when I teach a mammal class, I usually take students out to a site and within 15 minutes, we found a bottle with something in it, which is great for teaching the class, but it's sad in terms of the effect on wildlife. Um, most of the bottles, I mean, I'm sorry, 5% of the open bottles contain a specimen. If you found a skull in a bottle, you usually found more than one. And that's not because um, like an animal is attracting another animal. It's probably an artifact of the position of the bottle. It's like an angled in such a way that it just catches lots of things in it. And like I said before, uh, the most we got from a single bottle was 22. Three different species represented. Anyway, after doing all the calculations, we found that the annual mortality rate is 3%. And that equates to 40 mammals killed per mile each year. And that's just for the sites that we study. That does include all the other roads in these counties. So lots and lots of animals are dying each year just because people are littering. And it's much worse in the Southern Appalachian Mountains than in some other places. Because here in the mountains, um, we have these steep ravines and a lot of the local people don't wanna take things to the landfill. They'd rather just throw it down the hill. So um, it's amazing what you find down there. It's not just bottles. You find cars and washing machines and sofas and all sorts of things that people have thrown down these things. So it's not just people driving around throwing something or drinking out of the car window, people just using this as their dump. Um, and in the mountains, the bottles roll way down away from the road. As we went down into South Carolina, where there's flatter terrain, we didn't find nearly as, as many bottles because they do have litter pickups and a lot of those ones on the shoulders of the roads get get cleaned up but in the mountains they roll far 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 down into the woods and they never get picked up and they're more likely to kill to land in the kill position they land on a slope where they're more likely to have things that can't get back out and or they collect rainwater and things can drown in there and as i was saying that we have litter pickups but they don't go 100 meters off the road. They just walk along the shoulders of the roads, but that's not what, um, where all the bottles are that's killing things. These bottles stay there for decades. And we know that for a fact, because a lot of these bottles that we find, they don't even make anymore. Like we found like glass Clorox bottles with things in them or glass milk containers. Um, 
sometimes there was a plastic bottle that had a label from a certain year, like a movie promotion. Like we found one that had Back to the Future on it. That's like 1985. And that doesn't mean the animal was trapped in 1985. But the bottle has been there since 1985 and functioning as a trap continuously for decades like that. This is a poster from England. Um, and in England, they advertise this. Like in, in America, we talk about littering is just an eyesore. But you probably remember the old um, commercial from the 70s where somebody throws a trash bag out the car window and the Native American Indian starts to cry because it's just making our highways and, and mountains look ugly. Um, but they're, in England, they're trying to actually educate people about how it affects wildlife, too. So don't litter because it can kill wildlife. Some places have introduced bottle bills, too, where um, I don't know all the specifics of it, but basically you have to have the, the cap on it. That at least prevents people from or, or from animals to get entrapped in these bottles. All right. So you might be wondering, that's really interesting, but... Besides being interesting, how can I apply this information? Like, especially if you're an educator, how can you apply this information? Well, my wife is a science teacher. She does middle school science. And so each year um, they do an Earth Day litter pickup on the roads around their school. Um, and we live in a very rural area. So there's, there's mountain roads all around. It's not in a big city. So they take kids out and they pick up the trash, but we have them separate um, the trash from I mean, all, all the trash and from the bottles. And if it looks like there's something in it, we don't want them to dump it out. So we have them put them, put those bottles into individual um, gallon sized Ziploc bags. So if it spilled out, at least we've still retained all the contents. And then we take it back to the school and we can do a lot of things with that information. Um, the first thing they do is they sort it into recycle. How much of that trash could have actually been recycled? It's not just trash, trash. Um, we did have GPS, so they learned how to use GPS and they could map where we found these different things around their school. Uh, we did all sorts of measurements, like what percent of the trash we uh, collected was like plastic bottles or glass bottles or different colored kind of bottles. Um, and then the other thing is we, we removed the contents and we identified what we found as an alternative to our pellet dissection. It's basically the same thing. Um, if you don't know what owl pellets are, the owls swallow mice and stuff whole, and then they digest the meat and they regurgitate all the leftover, all the fur and the bones. So um, students often get these things and they can pick them apart and they can reconstruct the skeletons of whatever the prey of the owl was. Well, the stuff from the bottle is basically the same thing. It's just the fur and the bones that's left over, but they're not sterilized. So I have to have them use gloves and usually I just kind of do it more as a demonstration. But nevertheless, we can pick the bones out and we can use the same bone sorting charts that we use for owl pellets to help identify what these different things are, at least down to whether it's a shrew or a mouse or, or so forth. Um, I got a little ahead of myself. But anyway, this is our website. If you're interested, it's highlandsbiological.org. You can find out more about the Highlands Biological Station. Um, if you'd like to have more detailed information, if you go to the contact outreach page on our website, um, I have PDFs of these different studies. So this is the first one, which is just about the geographic distributions of these animals. The second one is about um, the littering impacts. And then the third one is the applications. All right, I had it backwards here. <laughs> um, the third one here is the applications of using this in the classroom. So if you'd like to have a detailed um, paper of that, just go to that website and you can print off the PDF of any of that stuff. I'll just leave it on there for now. Um, so do you have any questions for me? I went a little faster than I meant to, but that's okay. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And um, I'm happy to to read those out loud. Um, uh, but I do I personally have a question for you um, around um, educating the public at these, especially these pullout stations that you were doing the study. And I'm not sure if you're trying to continue it without disrupting behavior. But has there been any work of working with like uh, the National Park Service and other local um, entities? to educate the public of the impact of, you know, 
not putting trash into the trash cans or even taking their trash with them out of the park in response to kind of what you found with your study? Um, not directly. I, I do lectures like like this for different agencies. Um, we have some publications out um, locally, and we've been working with um, different groups. We may do litter pickups to to uh, promote when they promote their litter pickup to, to talk about this as part of that. It's not just because it looks ugly on the side of the road. We're we're trying to help prevent um, wildlife from being killed. Um, but yes, more could be done. But a lot of people have taken this. I'm kind of kind of bragging myself a little bit here. I'm not the first to do this, um, but I'm the first to do this in a long, long time. Um, and there wasn't much done in the past. People have known about this, but there hasn't been a lot published about this. But since these have been published, many people have um, followed up on this. And there's been studies in Italy and um, in Kentucky and, and all across the United States. So more and more of these studies using um, discarded bottles are being done and hopefully that will kind of snowball and help educate the public more. That's a good segue. I was asking you also if, uh, if there have been other similar studies done within North Carolina or is it just kind of been what you guys have done out of the, the Highlands? Um... There, there's been some unpublished things. Um, there's been a student at Appalachian State some years ago who looked at basically did the same thing we did, but but up there um, in Boone. Um, but then in other states like Tennessee and Kentucky, um, like I said, in, in, in Europe and in some other places like that. So we did have a question in the chat. It says, how can we uh, how can we get someone in involved in educating the public? Um, well, I'm available. <laughs> I, I didn't really describe what I do with the Highlands Biological Station, but I, my main job is that I'm the outreach coordinator. Um, I'm a biologist, but my day to day job is that I travel around to schools all over Western North Carolina, multiple counties. Um, but I can also do virtual programs like this, and I can do the same kind of program um, at different levels. So I can do for for like middle elementary, middle school levels as well as high school and adult levels. Um, if you'll indulge me for a second, part of what I do, I'm not going to do the whole thing with you, but part, what, part of what I do with the classroom is show them how to use a dichotomous key to help identify these skulls. So even if we don't like actually go out and collect bottles, um, we talk about this and I teach them how to identify what they might find if they were to do this themselves. So if you don't know what a dichotomous key is, it's just a step-by-step -step process of elimination. There, it's kind of like a flow chart, but they ask you a question and at each question you can rule out something. So like here, if you wanted to try to identify what a lizard is, first question was, does this animal have dry skin? So you go, yes, so you go to step two. Does it have hair? No, it's a lizard. Um, so there's a fancy one, that I can provide, but it's a little technical, even for, for younger kids, but, but it's not that technical that they can't do it, at least for the middle school level, because all we're looking at is these teeth. And so I just use pictures. So like, for example, here's a picture. Um, and just here, you can see that um, if, if this was a full size, like mouse, the skull would be the size of the screen. Well, this is way smaller than that. So you can tell that this is a tiny shrew. So it's probably either a, a least shrew or a pygmy shrew just because it's so small. And then using the, the, the dichotomous key, it tells you how to look at these teeth and what numbers and stuff they have. So like this least shrew is a small shrew and it only has three unicuspids visible. And then you flip it over and you can also see this little tiny fourth one there. So those are diagnostic characters for this shrew. Um, here's another one. Um, which is the smoky shrew because it's bigger but not super big and it has five equally sized teeth this is a pygmy shrew but again it's a tiny shrew with small uh small numbers of teeth here but there again you have to look for these little bitty teeth hiding behind the others um and then like this one is not a shrew because it's got the buck teeth this is a rodent and then we can look at the molars and say well this is a mouse because it has these round molars versus these zigzag molars like you find in a bowl. So there, these are some examples of what I could do with a, a school group, for example, or even adult groups, um, either using the real thing or even virtually this way. Anyway, if you're interested, um, go to that website. My, all my contact information is on there. 
And if you're a teacher, if you know a teacher, um, if, if you're local, I can come to your school. If not, I can um, do a virtual program for you. So we had another question. Um, I am curious if you have uh, considered working with other groups to reconstruct your study in other areas of the state. Um, I have worked indirectly. There, there was a student at the Highlands Biological Station. We have all these researchers, but many of them are graduate students working on their like doctoral dissertations and stuff, especially in the summertime. Um, this past summer, there was a student who was working with the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway and to basically just do surveys of small mammals along the Blue Ridge Parkway using a variety of techniques like actual traps and so forth. But they were also using bottles, uh, a lot of these scenic overlooks. So I've kind of been a advisor of sorts to that, although I wasn't directly involved. <clears throat> Any other questions? Someone might be chat uh, typing a question in the chat, um, and I can uh, send out this. Uh, um, all right, the, the link as well, so um, you can easily access that when I send out information after the lecture too. Um, but I mean, this for me has been fascinating. Um, Again, you'll have a different lot with it. You'll have different things in the eastern part of the state. Um, and fewer shrews, like the, the mountains are where they're heavily concentrated, yeah. but nevertheless, th th this still applies. Um, there's been a study in Virginia, for example, on the coast in uh, Norfolk, I think, where they mm -hmm. did the same thing and they found lots of different things, just fewer species, different species. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I know some groups that can pass along this uh, that may be reaching out for some more information. Uh, one of the questions was, was leaving the bottle still uh, gain more dead dead mammals for the study or just to monitor the amount of tra trash? Um, whenever we, we go back, we, we do look for uh, the skeletons in the bottles, too. Um, so we did that over several years. I did it from, it's been a while now. I didn't think how long it was, but we started in 2007 and we kind of wrapped it up in 2012. So from year to year then. Now, when I do it, it's mostly just as a part of a mammal workshop that I do. So we go out to like one or two sites and it, we look there and we just remove those that we find, but we don't do it on a, an annual basis anymore. So for the purpose of the study, you were leaving it to kind of monitor how much trapping you have. And then now you're going back and if right. you go do a study, you're pulling that trash out from there versus just the things that have. Yeah, bottles that have things in it. We, there's no way we could like clean up all the trash. We'd have to have, like dump trucks to, to get all that <laughs> stuff. So that's it's kind of an impossibility. But, um, but also, I mean, we don't want to get everything up because then I can't go out there and demonstrate this either. So it's kind of good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was a question of, um, did you think there was uh, any displacement of bottles from rains um, downstreams? That would slightly skew the data of where those shrews are living. Um, I'm not completely sure I understand what you're asking me, but but so the, I think the, the question is if you had like a shrew that would live at a higher elevation of the bottle getting washed downstream, if that would oh, skew the they, they don't get washed that far because it would be like miles and miles and miles, and that just doesn't happen. It would it might go you know a few hundred meters downstream, but that's that's all. So with the data, because you were using also just as an alternative to the pitfall traps for studying distribution, did y'all find a difference in what historically was thought of the distribution of the various species, or was it pretty accurate to it, what it, it current data was? Precisely. Um, it's just that it demonstrates the lack of effort to get the same data from, and you don't, and and you're not getting incidental captures. If you do a pitfall trap, you're going to be getting all sorts of stuff. And you're, and you're the cause because you put the bottles, I mean, the pitfall traps in the ground, but these are are killed anyway. So there's no need to add additional mortality by sinking pitfall traps in the ground just to get distributional data. And I will say too, like when you're looking for bottles, um, look at broken bottles too, because a lot of them break after 
having caught something. So just the bases of bottles, a lot of times you can find these these uh, bones in there because the, they get filled with rainwater and it freezes and they shatter. Um, it, or sometimes the bottle gets buried in the dirt and they can no longer capture anything, but that doesn't mean something wasn't captured prior to being buried. So you have to kind of go through everything. And did you find a difference in like the number of like small mammals you're finding based on the type of bottle, whether it was glass versus plastic versus like a ridged plastic or a smoother? Yeah, we, other people have, have done more actual studies like compare like green glass to brown glass or different size bottles we, we didn't analyze it that thoroughly but just anecdotally we we didn't see much difference they were in all, everything plastic bottles glass bottles of all colors all sizes it was more had to do with the uh, position of the bottle mm -hmm. if it was pointed uphill and had rainwater in it then it was a good trap and that would be more likely to catch things regardless of what it, material or size But the, the aluminum cans was kind of an, an enigma because other people have found bones in the aluminum cans, but we never have. I mean, I look, but I never have. And I can only assume it's because they're more lightweight and the animals can wiggle out of them more easily than a bottle. Um, but that's just my best guess. But it's still worth looking at. They just, I just never found anything. Uh, so someone asked if you could tell more, tell us more about the bottle that you found the 22 skulls in. Um, it was a big, like 40 <laughs> malt liquor bottle, so it, it could hold more. But it was just, you know, perfectly positioned um, on a steep slope, had rainwater in the bottom, and so just a lot of things are can, can go in there. I I don't think the remains of other animals, the smell is attracting shrews and other things really. Um, it's possible that insects could, because insects are in, like carrion beetles are in there eating these dead animals. And so they could be potentially going after these insects. But I think, it, again, it's just more the, the positioning of the bottle. Because you get to a point where you can, if you've seen enough of them, you can say, I bet you that one has one in it, just because it's so perfect. And, and nine times out of 10, you're right. It's got something in there. But I never find anything right on the shoulders of the highways, never. It's sort of always way down in the woods, buried under the leaves where the animals are rooting around. And you have to be careful, too, because especially in the mountains, because it's such a steep slope, because like I said, it's not just bottles. There's all sorts of things like barbed wire and windshields and all sorts of hazardous stuff. So you got to wear leather gloves and and, um, you know, heavy duty boots and things just to avoid getting cut. Um, and then, of course, you know, just safety issues of cars going by, too. You need, it's good to wear, um, you know, orange vests, especially if you're doing it with younger people. Um, be sure you pull it all the way off the highway. Um, I've never had to, like, rappel down a hill, but it's really steep sometimes, and you have to, like, hang on to things. But then, I mean, you have to get down there because that's where all the bottles are. They roll way down the hill. Yeah, I was going to ask how you get to some of those harder reach areas. <laughs> yeah, it's, you have to serpentine your way down the hill. <laughs> yeah. But it's 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 sad what kind of trash you find down there. Like mm -hmm. I said, there's washing machines and sofas and old cars. I found an old car from like the 40s one time and I was kind of afraid to look in there because maybe it was a car wreck and the missing person for all these years that might still be in there. Um, but I don't think so. I think it's just that the forest has grown up over an old farm mm -hmm. over the decades. But nevertheless, there's all sorts of interesting things you find. I can imagine. We do a, a annual lake cleanup at my park, and some of the stuff that we we have patrons pull out always always intrigues me. Of how did this even get into the park lake? Right. But, and here too, a lot of times people shouldn't, but they do. Um, like if they go deer hunting, they'll they'll get the parts they want, and then they dump the rest of the carcass down there. So it. it come across, you know, skeletons of these animals and a lot of times they're not completely decomposed yet and it reeks and so it's it's kind of a nasty job and just the stuff in the bottles can be really disgusting too. Um, but if you want the information, you have to deal with it. <laughs> well, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to limit to the chat. Otherwise, that's all the questions I have. Uh, this has been incredibly fascinating for me and I definitely think I 
familiar with pitfall traps and how those are kind of working. And so I think this is a, a unique way of gathering that data without having to, you know, in, potentially increase mortality by having that, um, those pitfall traps there. Um, and definitely uh, puts out a lot of interesting research that could be used to to educate the public as to why you should pick up your litter and take your litter with you beyond the aesthetic side of things. Um, you hear a lot with that as far as like ocean and the litter in the oceans, right. um, but not as much for the smaller mammals that you may not be thinking about. But in terms of scientific study, it's it's so much easier. And, say, and less expensive. You don't have to set traps. You don't have to buy materials. It's just there waiting for you. And there's no um, urgency to go out every morning because you've set the trap. It's just a nice day. Go out and, and it's like going on an Easter egg hunt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and lots more sites too, because there's all over the place, sadly. So we did get uh... Another question. Um, so, so not to be morbid, but uh, how long does it take approximately for these small animals to die in the bottles, assuming they just die, they're just dying of starvation or dehydration? Um, shrews have really fast metabolisms and they have a tendency to die anyway. Even if we, if you're setting traps and you try to take precautions, um, they're just really stressed and, and the mortality rate for shrews and traps is just high, period. Um, as far as like decomposition, it I don't really know. It depends on um, whether it's soaking in water or not, or whether they're scavenged. I will say a lot of the smaller shrews are probably underrepresented. There's probably more captured than we're actually finding because the little bones disintegrate more rapidly or they get scavenged by beetles more rapidly than the larger animals like mice and, and uh, short-tailed shrews. Um, but it's not uncommon to find a recently captured intact whole specimen too. I mean, it might have been captured like the night before. I found several of those and they didn't even smell yet. So it just depends on when you go out there and when they got captured. And again, some of those bones, you don't know. Um, it, they could have been there, you know, a few weeks or they could have been there for years. There, there's really no way of knowing when they were captured, except that during our first study, we were pretty thorough and, and found as many bottles as we could find. So anything that was captured, that we found the next time we went, we we're pretty confident had been captured at least within the last year. But the first visit, there's no way of knowing. And then a follow up with that is, uh, how long can a shrew go without uh, food or water? Um, I don't know the exact amount, but it's not very long. Yeah. They, they, they're just really stressed and they, um, like whenever I have done pitfall traps, for example, or, or Sherman traps with the little live traps, we try to put some food in there. We try to put like cotton batting because they can, um, they're very susceptible to, to low temperatures and so forth. Um, but even so the, the mortality rate is pretty high despite our best efforts. Here's to be it for questions. Again, thank you so much. This has been very educational. You're welcome. Um, and it's it's definitely interesting to hear a new new take on being able to uh, get some information about something uh, in a different way. Um, I would never have thought to to utilize while you're trying to see what the mortality rate rate is with the trash of being able to just get some basic information on distribution at the same time. Um, so that was interesting to hear that. Um, for those of you that are seeking EE credit, I will send out that form later uh, this week. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and we hope you join us again in, uh, for our December lecture.